tonight. We're very fortunate to have a program uh, brought to you by the Brown L. Library's Meeks Memorial Fund um, about Vermont's women in the abolition movement. Uh, we have with us Jane Williams, who's the director of the Rokeby Museum in Ferrisburg. She has a degree in, um, a master's degree in the historic preservation from the University of Vermont and has been the director of the Rokeby Museum since 1995. So, Jane, tell us about the women in the abolitionist movement in Vermont. What were they up to? What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a little background about the abolitionist movement in general, and then I'm going to fit the women into the broader picture. Um, because they were very important. There were, there were a lot of things that happened. Someone is coming. Um, the first thing I want to remind everyone is that slavery arrived in the British colonies with the first colonists in 1619 and was part of the whole development, particularly the physical development since they did most of the physical labor, um, and was of long standing, um, long before the abolitionist movement came along. And the first really uh, pronounced public uh, statements about abolition came in the years leading up to the Revolutionary War. Obviously, the Declaration of Independence, we believe that all men are created equal, would have a big impact on, on such a subject. Um, and that period, those years leading up to the um, Revolutionary War, there was a tremendous rhetoric, revolutionary rhetoric of liberty and equality, and not for, not for the slaves, but it was still, it was out and about. So it had an impact. And it was one of the first times there was a really specific um, demand that slavery might end. This was a sort of a new idea, but it fit in with what the colonists were claiming for themselves. Um, and some individual slaves did earn their freedom that way. Some slaveholders said, you know what? If I want it for myself, this isn't right. Um, some slaves petitioned. Some slaves went to court. It was, it was a very a period of a lot of ferment, a lot of things happening. And so there were some chances there. One of the big chances came during the war itself. The British, very smartly, offered slaves freedom if they would fight. Fight with us and we'll free you. So a lot did. Finally, the Continental Army was forced to do the same thing um, because they, they were running out of recruits. So they also, it was a way to earn your freedom. So it was the first time when a lot of that sort of idea came out and was articulated and people actually got their freedom. And it was also uh, what historians now call the first emancipation. Slavery in the North did not survive this period. By the end of the 1780s, there was no more slavery in the North. Of course, it started where? Here in Vermont in 1777 with the Constitution that outlawed slavery, and then Massachusetts in 1780 and Pennsylvania. And some states did it by court decree. Some did it by legislation. But by 1800 or so, all of the northern states had outlawed slavery. Then came the Constitution. Big, you know, big f fight, big to do to get free, and then you have to form yourself into a new, into a new country. And so you have to sit down and actually start working these things out. This is what historians often call the counter-revolution, because then you retreat from all of that beautiful rhetoric that you've been spouting since 1776, and you say, well, here's how we're really going to do it. Um, the 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 Constitution protected slavery. There was no way for a United States of America to form itself if slavery was not legal. The southern colonies would have bolted. So the northern colonies essentially gave in. And it's very interesting because the word slave does not appear anywhere in the Constitution, yet there are several um, articles that very clearly protect slavery. The, probably the worst one during the antebellum years of the 19th century was the Three-Fifths Clause. Though the southerners considered that their slaves were not citizens, they got to count them as three-fifths for figuring their apportionment to their number of uh, elected delegates to the Federal Congress. And what that meant was they always had uh, way out of proportion, because by 1860, there were four million slaves. They got three-fifths of them as their numbers to, so they were always overrepresented in Congress and had more power. Um, the Constitution also protected the right to reclaim fugitive slaves. People often associate that with the 1850 Fugitive Slaves Law, law but it, it was guaranteed right in the Constitution. And then the third thing was the African slave trade. The African slave trade had been a big issue for quite a while. For some reason, people considered the stealing of 
people from Africa and bringing them over to be sold into slavery as somehow worse than slavery itself. And there was a lot of agitation for the African slave trade to end. So it was a compromise. The Constitution said that Congress could not end the African slave trade until 1808, which they did. The minute 1808 hit, they did. Um, now the first groups, the first organized abolitionist groups started in the end of the, of the 18th century, the 1780s and 90s. The first one was in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Abolition Society, followed by one in New York. And these were very interesting organizations. The PAS was a very prestigious organization. It was made up of wealthy men. A lot of them were lawyers and other professionals from the very socially elite levels of society. Um, and they, they believed that slavery was wrong, and they wanted to do something about it. But what they did was very quiet. They, they were, um, one historian said they ran their organization like sober businessmen, which is of course what they were. They helped individuals. They used their legal skills. They used their political clout to try to assist individuals and families and just very quietly in the back room. So that was helpful, but it wasn't really going to do anything much to end slavery in the United States. Um, then in 1816, another uh, oddball, I always think of it as, odd, as an oddball, sort of an organization came along, the American Colonization Society. One of the problems for a lot of people and a lot of Northerners, this is a big problem in the North, we want to get rid of slavery, but we don't want to have anything left over. That is, black people living in our town or our state. We want slavery to end, but we want them to go away too. Well, this was the, th this was the idea of the American Colonization Society that freed slaves. Slave owners would free their slaves and they would be returned to Africa, um, which is an odd notion since they were, many of them, six generations. I mean, they'd come before the Mayflower. They, they were no more African than we're, I, you know, I'm German. Um, so it, it didn't go down well at all um, with, with African Americans. They were basically saying, we won't go. Um, but it was just, it was a little bit um, fantastical. I mean, the idea that you would actually be able to raise the money and ship hundreds of thousands of people back across the water. They did found the colony of Liberia. People did go over to form governments and communities and infrastructure. Many of them died because they were not immune to the tropical diseases. I got to be very, they couldn't get anyone to go because it was a kind of almost a death sentence. Um, and it was, began to become heavily criticized, first by African Americans for obvious reasons, and then some white people began to join in and say, this is not against slavery. This is against black Americans. And this, you, the problem you're addressing is not actually the problem you claim to be addressing. Um, but in the end, it, it never had much success. Then in the 1830s, things started to change. Um, in 1831, a young Boston, um, well, actually from Newburyport, um, very highly religious young man named William Lloyd Garrison had been in Baltimore, had sort of gotten indoctrinated in some of the abolitionist ideas, started a newspaper called The Liberator. And I've brought some copies. Um, the Robinsons of Rokeby, the family whose home is now a museum, um, we have the first issue. The first issue came out in January 1831. And the paper was published weekly every Saturday until the end of the Civil War. And we have most of them. And this is just a few that were, um, yes, these are. Um, we have, um, yeah, we, I should have washed my hands before I came. We have, um, we had m multiples of many copies. One of the first projects I worked on at the museum was buying proper uh, newspaper boxes and going through them all and ordering them. And I, and I just put one in each, you know, one copy. And sometimes we had five. So what we did was we deaccessioned these for our education collection so that we can use them with the public. Um, and so you can take a look at these later if you'd like. So this, 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 this was a big deal. This was a sort of a herald to the world that something new was coming. Um, and it was, it was important because through all this time up until the end of the Civil War, as I said, it came out every Saturday. It was a rallying point. It was, a, it was you know, hammering home the message. It was a very steady thing that was always there that helped keep everything moving forward. Um, in 1832, Garrison was critical in founding the New England Anti-Slavery Society. In 1833, the American Anti-Slavery Society was founded. And in 1834, Vermont, another first, 
uh, became the first state to form a state auxiliary to the national organization, to the American Anti-Slavery Society. Now, these organizations were nothing like the Pennsylvania Abolition Society or the New York Manumission Society. These were not gentlemen. These were ordinary people. They were not wealthy or from a high level. Some were, but as they weren't only from that class. They were a broad spectrum, and most of them were really ordinary folks. Um, second, they defined slavery as a sin against God. These people were radical Christians. They came, many of them, out of the revival movements that had gone on during the 1820s, and they were, they were far out. I mean, these people were regarded by luna as lunatics by a lot of people. They were really out there on some scale of radical Christianity. Um, but I've got a little quote here from Theodore Weld, who was one of the big organizers, and this is how he put it. He said, God has committed to every moral agent the privilege the right and the responsibility of personal ownership. This is God's plan. Slavery annihilates it. Everything about slavery went against everything that God had in mind, so it was a sin. And that's, that's a pretty simple concept if you're a Christian. If it's a sin, you know where it, you know where it is. <laughs> um, third, their efforts were not private or individual. These were not people who, I mean, they did help fugitive slaves. They did render aid. But their main goal was not to find one person that they could use their legal skills to help. Their goal was to make as much noise as they possibly could, to blare their message out over the world, and to really get, essentially, a movement. They wouldn't have called it a movement, but the kind of thing we think of as movements today. Their strategy. Um, <coughs> also involved rejecting a gradual end to slavery. All of these previous ideas were, well, slowly, over time, you know, slave owners will free slaves on their deathbed. There'll be various times when this will happen. It'll take a long time. No, 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 no. Their call was immediate emancipation. Um, and the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society had a wonderful quote that I think explains how they came to that. <clears throat> they said, we do not talk of gradual emancipation because we find no authority for the gradual relinquishment of sin. <laughs> we call on slave owners to repent now, today, immediately. Right? If it's wrong, you don't say, well, it's wrong, but I'll quit next week. Um, fifth, they were not just opposed to slavery. They wanted full equal rights. They didn't want to free the slaves and then leave them in some kind of limbo. They wanted them to become American citizens. In fact, they were, as far as they were concerned, they were American citizens. If you were born on American soil, you were an American citizen. They should have the right to vote, equal employment opportunity, everything that uh, was available to white Americans. There, there are two primary tactics. Their number one um, belief and commitment was to peaceful means. They did not believe in violence of any kind. And in fact, some of them, they were pacifists, and some of them were, again, pretty far out on a radical level of pacifism. They also didn't like political activity. They didn't like, um, voting was OK. They didn't tell people not to vote. But they didn't like running, forming a party and running candidates, because you would immediately start compromising. They believed in moral suasion. They were going to convince everybody that their idea was right, and then somehow you, everyone, was going to have a change of heart. Now, this I know sounds, but um, the people who did start a political party didn't get very far. The truth is about this period is that these were the first steps toward the Civil War. At the time, people didn't really understand that. But this was the beginning of a division in our country that just got wider and wider and wider until there was really apparently only one way to solve it. Um, so basically, if you could agree with this set of ideas and tactics, you could join their organization. They didn't care what church you went to. They didn't care what political party you belonged to. You just, if you were for immediate emancipation and you were against violence, come with us. Help us um, change American society. And they also welcomed in that group that welcoming sort of gesture. They welcomed African Americans, and they welcomed women. And that was incredibly unusual. Organi any kind of organized activity would be, have been almost 100% segregated by sex and segregated by race. But they didn't believe in that. And of course, it would have been pretty silly for them to call for equal rights and then not let black people join their organizations. 
Um, but in a lot of ways, it was the women's participation that caused a lot of problems. Um, there weren't a lot of women, but there were some. Um, the Boston group, the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society, was very large, very well organized, very effective. Um, you'll perhaps not be surprised to learn that what they did was they had a fair. They made things. They sewed things. They made little trinkets and books and all sorts of things that they sold at this huge Christmas fair. And they raised more money. They, they essentially raised the money that paid the office expenses of the American Anti-Slavery Society. They were incredibly important, and they were very effective. Um, but there was a contention that got worse and worse as women started to take on other roles. Some women didn't want to just sit home and knit little things to sell. Some women wanted to go out and speak. Some women wanted to organize. Some women wanted to uh, do all sorts of things. Um, they had been very active in the petition campaign. Um, and it, it was sort of seen as appropriate for women because they were not allowed to vote. It would be their way of addressing Congress. Petition, the petition campaign was primarily the, Congress said, it's in the Constitution, we can't stop it. We can't outlaw slavery. But they had control over the District of Columbia, which was a slave city. So the petitions were, you could end, you could end slavery there. And hundreds of Vermont women organized. And they, were, they tended to be the organizers. They'd get the petitions. They'd walk around the little village. It was all Starksboro, you know, all over the little villages. And they would get people's names. And they would roll them up, and they would send them to Congress. And that was, that, well, there wasn't a lot of problem with that. The, the real um, division came when women started to speak um, to promiscuous audiences. And I can usually say when I'm giving one of these talks that I'm speaking before a promiscuous audience, but barely. There's only one man here. A promiscuous audience. We're all women. <laughs> promiscuous audience. And that's OK. It's perfectly OK. If I'm speaking only to women, then everybody says, that's good. But if there are men in the audience and I get up, uh-oh. That's not a good idea. So there was a young Quaker woman born in Worcester, Mass, named um, Abby Kelly who spent virtually the entire year of 1840 traveling through Connecticut, which was not a friendly state, walking by herself from town to town, speaking against slavery. At the, um, and she would, she would do, she was also what's, what's known as a come-outer. She would go into church services, and in the middle of it, she would stand up and start, spe <laughs> start speaking against slavery. Um, so she was really. Some t using some more confrontational tactics. But just standing up and speaking was considered confrontational for a woman at that time. In the 1840 annual meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society, this issue was coming to a head. There were a group of more conservative people who didn't like this. But the Garrisonians, the radicals said, look, they're like us. They're, we're, they're equal. They, have, they should be able th to speak. They feel moved to do this work. We shouldn't stop them. We need them. So at the 1840 annual meeting, they nominated and elected Abby Kelly to a committee. At that moment, the conservatives walked out, and the American Anti-Slavery Society split into two. And a lot of people think that was a stupid thing to do because it split the movement, but this was one of these, you know, hewing to the principles. Um, the two organizations kind of paralleled each other and um, called old organization a new organization. Um, now, the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society um, also welcomed women. And here, in this folder, I have we have in our collection the original record book. And this is a photocopy, but I, I that I just, it's a little delicate. I didn't feel very comfortable bringing it out. The original, the records of the founding meeting, which w took place in May of 1834 in Middlebury. And I actually looked through this, whoops, these are all the other ones. Uh, there were 120 um, people Men, well, a couple of women, not I think one or two I found. And I looked to see if I could find anyone in Essex, and I, and I didn't. Um, so this is the, the records of that, if you want to take a look at it. Um, every year, they would pass a resolution encouraging the women to get involved, welcoming them into the work, asking them to participate. And it seems to me that reflected one of two things. It reflected that women weren't doing anything, and they were saying, get off your butts and help us. Or it reflected that they were doing things, and we wanted to say, yes, we support you. You know, Have courage. Go ahead. Whatever it is you're doing, keep doing it. And I don't know which it was. Oh, which no. Was. And I'll tell you why. There are virtually no records of women's activity in Vermont. The fact that this resolution passed every year makes it clear to me that it was considered OK. Um, but 
there's, I think I also have the treasurer's records in here. I know there was a Cornwall Female Anti-Slavery Society because they sent money in that Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society mode. In the treasurer's book, you'll see Cornwall Female Anti-Slavery Society, $2, whatever. They would send money. So I know they existed. I know there was one in Randolph because they had a speaker. And unfortunately, I forgot to check this. I can't remember who the speaker was. They had someone come and give a lecture. And they had the speech printed. And it says right on the cover, you know, Randolph Female Anti-Slavery Society. Um, and as I said, the petition campaign, we know that many, many, many Vermont women organized these campaigns, helped to collect signatures, and signed. Um, but were they all over, or were those few unique? I really don't know. Um, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is this is, a, this is a transcript of a record book that was donated to the Norwich Female Anti-Slavery Society last year or the year before. And um, I'll tell you this story. Um, there was a woman in town whose father-in-law was videotaped as part of an oral history project with seniors. And he said in this videotape that he had this record book. When he was seven, the church was being cleaned out, and all of these records and books and old hymnals and God knows what all were being just tossed. And he was there helping. And for some reason, out of a box, he plucked this book, and he took it home. And his father, who I believe was a Dartmouth College professor, looked at it and said to him, you know, that's very special. That's really, really important. You should hang on to that. He had kept it his entire life. He was in his 80s. And no one in his family knew he had it. He'd never talked to anyone about it. And he said on this videotape, I hope after I die that it will go to the Norwich Historical Society. So when his daughter-in-law saw that, she went and found it, and she, <laughs> she gave it to the Norwich Historical Society. <laughs> so it's remarkable. It's a, it's a book. It's their records from 1843 to 1850. It's very con you know, it's continuous. They're meeting almost monthly. And it's, it's a gold mine and a treasure and just one of the most important finds in Vermont of recent past. We still do not know if these women were unique. I mean, were churches dumping records all over the state and these books going out? Y you'd think they would, that some more of them would have survived. You know, which people cite that they were meeting up with other members of other groups? No. No. Just no. no. It's a fascinating organization for a number of reasons. One, they formed their society in 1843. And this is after the big split, when this was a kind of a touchy issue. So, and they were, they, were or, they, were orga they were organized through their church, which was not uncommon. There was a minister who helped them get everything going. They were evangelical women. And they seemed to be relatively conservative. So for them to do this at a time when women's involvement had sort of been stigmatized by this big split, I think is very interesting. Um, in the opening, they, 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 however, um, only a few of them, this, this list of their names, most of them, it's Jerusha Amston, Fanny Allen, Clarissa Nichols, Jilly Emerson, only a few of them had a missus, even though most of them were married. And that, w that was a signal of some kind of, I'm taking some independent action here. I'm Sophia Brigham, not Mrs. Somebody Else Brigham, which I think is interesting. Um, but what they, uh, and they were very much in line with the kind of beliefs and um, tactics of the, of the abolitionists I just described. They say right here in their preamble that slavery is a, a direct violation of the law of God. They believe slavery was a sin. They believe that it is their duty, therefore, to support immediate emancipation, right out there with William Lloyd Garrison, and that they should use all lawful means um, to exterminate this sum of abominations, as they called it. Um, they also believed, according to their constitution, they were going to fight for the elevation and character, for the elevation of the character and condition of the people of color, and to their admission to equal rights and privileges with the whites. So they were totally behind the equal rights. Um, and any female who agreed with their basic precepts was welcome to join their society. So whatever church this was, and I'm not sure it ever says it was the Congregational Church. You didn't have to belong to that church, even though it was sort of an outgrowth of their church activity. Um, the interesting thing is that most of what they did was very sort of feminine. Um, they, they took a fairly um, women's role kind of approach to their activities. Um, 
and there, I've, this is a transcription, and these are their meetings somewhere in 1843 here, and it's, you know, May, June, June, July, August, August, September, September, November. They're just meeting on a very regular basis. They meet at somebody's house. Very often, it says, most of the time employed in quilting. They would get together, and they would sew, and they would quilt. They would also read. They were reading um, some reading from the thrilling narrative of Charles Ball. This is one of the um, very important early slave narratives. Charles Ball escaped from slavery and wrote a book about it, and they were reading that book. Um, they collected clothing. Um, and what they did with all of these articles that they sewed and put together and collected, they sent some of them to the Dawn Settlement in Canada. The Dawn Settlement was one of the two major settlements for fugitive slaves in Canada. And they were supplying those people with clothing, blankets, quilts, and a whole range of things. Um, since last meeting, a box of clothing has been forwarded by the Society to, Hiram, to Reverend Hiram Wilson for the benefit of fugitive slaves who have found an asylum in Victoria's domain. That's an illegal activity. That's bordering on an illegal activity for these ladies who are sitting together in each other's homes sewing. Um, now, 1844, they get a letter from Hiram Wilson, so they're still working with him. Then there was a letter printed in the Green Mountain Freeman, which is, was a Vermont abolitionist paper. So they're keeping up. They're reading, they're reading the local abolitionist stuff. They're very on top of things. And there was a letter in there from a woman named Mrs. Work. Um, and her husband was imprisoned in Missouri um, for the alleged crime of assisting his fellow brother in escaping from bondage. Well, as women, they related to her, and they put together a whole box of stuff for her. They went around town collecting um, to immediately, and then voted that they immediately forward to her two bed quilts and some other small articles. Again, it's just this interesting combination of a very nurturing kind of women's role in the service of something that most people consider to be radical and illegal. They also were sending clothing to Henry Highland Garnett. Henry Highland Garnett was a black minister. His uh, family had been enslaved. His parents escaped with the entire family. I think he was nine or so when, when his family came to the North. So he was educated in the North. Um, he was a very important figure nationally and actually was in sort of competition with Frederick Douglass for, you know, who was a sort of the top guy. And, uh, African-American speakers and leaders. Um, but he, in Troy, New York, um, aided many fugitive slaves. And they were always sending him things. They were always collecting clothing to send down to him. Um, and he says in this letter, and they've copied this letter, this letter into the book from him. Are they, it's not the actual letter, which is too bad. Uh, but th you know, this is a letter from Henry Highland Garnett, an unknown, <laughs> previously unknown letter. So this is uh, important. Um, and he says that um, without any doubt, the good ladies of Norwich will have the pleasure of making a, many a suffering one happy. He also says, um, he talks about pr a particular fellow who came to them. He was thinly clad, cold, and shivering. And so the materials that they've sent, it's a way for them to know that they've something concrete about, about the person that they've helped. He says here, the articles you sent are of the best selection. And that suggests to me that they were not just sending the oldest, most worn out clothes that might actually be useless to someone. They were sending things that were of good quality. Um, he also says in this letter something very interesting, which is, since my return from Vermont last winter, I didn't know Henry Highland Garnett had ever been in Vermont. But, and I, it's not clear if he was there to speak to them or what he was doing in Vermont. Um, but he says to them, do you think that if I should come in Vermont and lecture, that our friends would be willing to aid me a little in this way? So he's asking for their advice about whether he could, you know, it would be worthwhile for him to come into Vermont to raise money and support for his work harboring and, and aiding fugitive slaves. Um, then the, I, the, there's another um, a s person they were assisting. Uh, I think they say later that her name is Frances. Miss F. Coburn, now Miss Coburn. I don't know who Miss Coburn is. She was also in Canada aiding fugitive slaves, and they sent her a box of clothing. Um, 1847, 1848. Um, quilted, 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 <laughs> quilted. Uh, it's, it's just so interesting. Now, um, I think this is 18... 
1949. Now they're helping the Mendi Mission in Africa, which was a Christian mission to Christianize um, uh, Africans. And they appointed a, somebody to visit all the members of the society and solicit funds. And then 1850 is the last year of their records. And I don't know if the record book changed to somebody else's hands, if their activity stopped. Um, that was the year the Fugitive Slave Law passed. Maybe they felt, I, you know, I was, was going to say maybe they felt uncomfortable um, assisting fugitives after this law passed, but most Northerners were not put off by this law. They were galvanized by this law. They were infuriated by this law. People who'd been on the, sitting on the fence were no longer on the fence. People who had taken no action started to take action. So this is just one, and really the only thorough example we have of what Vermont women were doing. And, you know, I like to think that, that it was happening all over and that those record books, somebody just didn't at the right moment pick that. Can you imagine the, just the serendipity of this surviving? And, and, you know, and, it, and also, I think it was fairly clear that if this little boy's father had not said to him, that's something special, he probably would have lost it. I mean, he was well over 80 by the time it was, it was donated. So I hope that tells you something. The last thing I brought, which I haven't mentioned, um, is a broadside from our collection. Um, this um, was one, a big activity um, of the American Anti-Slavery Society in, what? in 1843. Um, Sending out itinerant speakers. I talked to you about Abby Kelly, who spent all of 1840 walking through Connecticut. There were itinerant speakers out all the time. And in, in 1843, they decided that they were going to have what they called the 100 conventions. They drafted a group of speakers, and they were going to go out all over the North evangelizing for anti-slavery. And if you were willing to organize the meeting, they'd send you the speakers. So uh, Rowland, Rowland T. Robinson of Rokeby, North Ferrisburg. He wasn't going to pass this chance up. He organized what they called the Great Convention. And if you read this, uh, you will see that Frederick Douglass, the eloquent fugitive from slavery, whose thrilling narration of his own history and sufferings while in bondage and powerful appeals for his oppressed brethren have accomplished so much, was one of the speakers. They came up into Vermont in July. They went to Randolph, they went to Middlebury, and they went to Ferrisburg. And in uh, Douglas's, uh, William Lloyd Douglas, <laughs> Frederick Douglass wrote three autobiographies. And it's the second or third one he refers to this trip. And he talks about how the stalwarts in Ferrisburg paved the way, and they were so well received, as opposed to Middlebury, where they were pelted with stones. Yeah. So they came up into Vermont in July as a sort of a little, it was almost like a little precursor to their main um, trip which started later in the fall. And actually, I am sorry to tell you, fell apart almost immediately. They didn't get too far. Um, John Collins, who was also in this crew, had a lot of other radical beliefs that he was espousing. He was a sort of a proto-communist um, and trying to form communes. And he had a lot of wacky ideas. Um, anyway, he and Frederick Douglass got fighting. So, But this was um, a wonderful moment. and. We uh, found the speech that he gave in Ferrisburg transcribed in a local newspaper. And this is just a shred. This is just a little scrappy piece of paper. Um, it was a poster that would, would have been, they would have printed them up and posted them all over, you know, Shalott, North Ferrisburg, Ferrisburg, maybe over into Hinesburg, who knows how far and wide. And they weren't intended to last more than a couple of weeks. True, true, true ephemera. Um, so. As, as ephemeral as it is, I mean, it's, it's extreme ephemerality makes it incredibly valuable. This is the sort of thing that just does not survive. And, and it's Frederick Douglass. I mean, could, could it be any better? <laughs> um, so there's that. These, um, Rokeby is primarily known as a stop on the Underground Railroad, which I have not addressed. These are transcriptions of the letters in our collection documenting fugitives from slavery who were harbored at the, at the museum in the 1830s and 40s. Does it mention Mrs. Robinson at all in any of those mentions? No. Now, this is a, yeah, I'm glad you asked that, because you, we have the two of them there. And um, she's rarely mentioned. I mean, 
one of the women who's in one of these record books is um, the wife of Orson Murray, who was a minister in Brandon, who was a real firebrand and an organizer. I have not seen Rachel's name. Um, we also have in our collection, I totally forgot about this, I could have brought it, um, a little pamphlet called A Letter to the Women of the North. And I don't know if you know the Grimke sisters. They were also speakers, Sarah and Angelina. They were born in South Carolina in a very wealthy slave family. Um, they just were sort of naturally offended. They thought this was just horrible. They Yes, they, they were from a very wealthy South Carolina slaveholding family. But for somehow the two of them just hated it. And they came north, they converted to Quakerism, and they also began speaking. They were the two other great uh, female speakers. Um, they wrote a very famous uh, document uh, called Letter to Women of the South. They, they tried to, and this is another thing women often did, and, and, it, and it was effective. I mean, they actually felt this. They, they basically said, put yourself in the slave mother's position. Imagine having your children snatched from you. Imagine having any man who feels like coming in and raping you just being able to. Imagine, try to put yourself, and that was very effective. They had a lot of empathy, and it really was part, a lot of what engaged women. So the open letter or a letter to the women of the North was a sort of a mirror of the one that Grimke's had written to women of the South. And there are letters implying that it was written by Rachel. It's, uh, it's, it says, it says an, it's by, by a woman from Vermont. That's all it says on it. We have, I think, the only co known copy in our collection. Um, maybe was the it found in the house so that it would be connected? Oh, yes, it was in our house. Yeah, everything we had was, was in the house. It was house. found there. Yes, it was, was left there, yes. Uh -huh. It's all, it's all. It didn't throw anything away. No, much. no, they were. Um, I mean, I hate to speak ill of them, but there are some things they might have thrown away. But <laughs> yes, and I actually, I sometimes have volunteers who work on collections come in after weeks and said, "I cleaned out a closet last week." <laughs> Still, you're cleaning out closets after all. Well, not too much anymore. But when I started as a volunteer, I I opened every drawer and every secretary in the house. And actually, a lot of stuff is still in those secretaries. We haven't, we don't have space to store it. So we know that she shared her husband's views. Um, there's a PS in here about uh, a fugitive, uh, some men who came. Um, and they actually didn't stay very long. Most of the fugitives who came to Rokeby stayed for relatively long periods of time. These people had gotten, had a very violent beginning to their escape and were on their way to Canada and would stay only one night. But in this little PS that she wrote to a close friend, um, these men unburdened themselves to her. She talks about how they, um, they believed that they would escape easily, they believed that they would get to the north quickly, and that they would very soon be able to send for their families. And they said if they had known, they might never have gone. They were, they were feeling wretched, they missed their families, they were devastated. And what does she say? She says something about how grief sat heavy on their hearts. And in one night, to a stranger they'd never met, they just had this very personal, deep conversation about their lives and their feelings and things that had happened to them. So you get the sense of, of, of that kind of involvement. But we have very little written from her. Um, her name her doesn't appear. She, kept. she didn't keep a diary. She, she did. Um, we do have some diaries, but not of that time. No, well, yes, of that time period. But yeah. I'll tell you something about the 19th century. One of the m m most, uh, what's the word, preoccupying things of your life was your health. They didn't have aspirin. Um, people were always writing in letters and diaries about their health, and Rachel ha had serious health problems. Uh, in the one diary she kept, she was away at a kind of like a spa, it's a, a nursing home kind of place, trying to get well. So, how many kids? Did they, have? they had four children. Did they have daughters that were involved in this? None of their children adopted their views. Really? No. None of their children adopted their views. Their daughter Anne was probably the most sympathetic to their views. Their oldest son Thomas may have been the least sympathetic, but he died relatively young, and we have very little. 
um, material on him. There are two sons, George and Rowland Evans. That's their son, Rowland Evans, who's the well-known author, if you're familiar with him. George was a thoroughgoing racist. George's letters, um, you know, talk about the damn niggers and um, he lived at home. George never married, and his mother always. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Kick him out. <laughs> Whenever she, well, it was this way farm families were. You know, he was there to work on the farm. She hired black help. They were very involved with the African American families in the area, and some of them, one in particular, Mingo, was involved with that family. You know, for 30 years. Um, but there are a series of letters that George wrote when his brother was in New York. Um, they were going through hired help women. Uh, who came in as domestic help and just, oh, now we've got Frances. She smells even worse, he'd say, complaining to his brother. Um, Rowland did not share his parents' views, but was more sympathetic and, and later in his life, I think, was able to look back and have respect for what they did. George may have, I don't know, he didn't have occasion to write it out the way Rowland did, but Rowland was a writer, so. And, and it's interesting how their children didn't, um, didn't adopt any of their parents' views. And um, one, of our, one of our tour guides once said to me, how did he put it? He said, well, what would you do if your parents were Quaker saints? <laughs> well, now! <laughs> Um, when, when the Robinsons came, the Robinson family came from Newport, Rhode Island to Ferrisburg in 1793. There already was a Quaker meeting in Ferrisburg. Um, they came up from Dutchess County and they came from Newport. Those are the two primary places they came from. Um, there was a, the meeting house was built in 1796, so I do think there were meetings at the Robinsons' home because Thomas Robinson, uh, the abolitionist's father and his wife, were clerks of the men's women and the women's meeting, and they were both clerks of the men's meeting that's and women's built, meeting. That's the house that they yes. were met at. Yes. Some of that built? Uh, the early part was built in the 1780s. The part that you see when you drive by that big front, that was added in 1814. Um, but Rowland and Rachel left the Friends in 1846 because they were not doing enough to oppose slavery. They were not, the Quakers weren't doing enough. They and a group of their friends, Quaker meetings are organized at the monthly, the quarterly, and the yearly level. So the monthly is Ferrisburg. It's your local congregation. The quarterly would have included all of the Quaker meetings in Vermont, and the quarter was lodged in Ferrisburg. So Ferrisburg was sort of Quaker central for the state. Then all of those meetings belonged to the New York yearly meeting, and once a year you would go to New York for a really big meeting. And they would go, and they were trying to get the New York Yearly Meeting to sign a petition, to speak out, to take an action, and they could not move them. So they quit. Then what? They just stayed they, on Sundays? I guess. I mean, I don't know. You know, I don't know what they did. Maybe they had their own silent worship. I mean, as you know, the Quaker beliefs are very simple. You don't need a minister standing up. You can just sit, and if you just close your eyes and can center down, as they say, it's better done communally, but not necessarily. So the, we're, we're doing a Civil War sites in Essex. Oh, you're doing Howard Coffin's yeah, thing. Howard yeah, Coffin's good. Thing. And I'm thinking, when you were saying that there wasn't records, I was thinking, if we run across any mention of any societies, you'll be among the first to know. Well, I, I had Patty Wiley from the Vermont Historical Society put in her little email newsletter to ask people all across the state. I thought, Because after I got this, I thought, well, what if somebody's sitting on something and they just thought nobody cared? Or they had it all their life and didn't think anything about it. I, and I didn't, I got a few responses. I didn't, I didn't get anything like this book that I have. Has haven't. anybody gone through all the early newspapers of that 1840 period to see if there's mentions of people you know, like local, local news, like the Essex Reporter of the 1840s? No. Um, like there would be some there, the, yeah, I, if you had somebody who was interested in doing that, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the Virgins Vermonter, which was the, the local paper for, for, for our area, and there's unbelievably fascinating material in it. But about abolition? Oh, about yes, about everything. But it doesn't mention women at all. Um, well, I haven't found anything that mentions women, but it mentions a lot of other stuff. Um, actually, it will in odd ways. When, when Frederick Douglass was speaking in Middlebury, a black woman stood up 
So that told me that there were blacks in the audience and there were women in the audience, and complained about how her son was treated in town. So women showed up at these general meetings. I mean, that's one. That was one little. I mean, it's tiny, but it's a, it's a little. It's a little fact. You know, this is you, you pick up these tiny little facts and you sweep them all up and hope you can get enough of them to to under, that understand. Out, being out there, but I, I was sort of stunned to find that you really only had one organization that you had papers for. And of course, you've asked the Vermont Historical Society what they have and nada, right? Well, they have. Um, we own this record book, um, the original record book from the formation of the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society. The, Historical Society owns this um, account book. This is the treasurer's account book. You know who the treasurer was? Um, well, it changed. It was B.F. Haskell. Like Haskell Opera, Opera House? Uh, no, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Mr. Haskell was from Addison County. I will tell you that there is what I call the Addison County Mafia. They ran the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society. The executive committee. I don't have it with me, but. Um, from the founding, within a matter of years, um, 80 or 90 percent of the people on the executive committee, which was the actual sort of governing organization that met regularly and made things go in between annual and semi-annual meetings, were at, living in Addison County with, a, with one or two from Montpelier. Um, and RT was the clerk of that. So he was, I think, very much, Rowland Thomas, I'm sorry, Robinson known to us as RT. Uh, <laughs> well, they're all named Rowland. I mean, there's a Rowland everywhere you look, so we end up having to give them names so we know who we're talking about. Um, yeah. Yes. There were no Rokebys. Rokeby is the name, um, there's an English manor house called Rokeby Park. Um, it's owned by the British National Trust. You know, it's got 50 rooms and silver and gold and pictures and mahogany, one of the, you know, like a, what you think of as a British house. Um, it was built by a gentleman architect, architect named Thomas Robinson. And at that, in that location of Rokeby Park, which is a large park, there was some important battle. I don't know English history. My ignorance is coming through. Um, uh, Sir Walter Scott, wrote a novel, a long novel in verse, about that battle called Rokeby. And it was a best seller of its time in the early 19th century. If you could read, and you lived in an English-speaking part of the world, you knew that book. And people took it as a name. This was a thing that people did. Now, our Robinsons, of course, had their, their home, their first our ancestor who came to Vermont was Thomas Robinson. So the person who built Rokeby Park was Thomas Robinson. So for them, I think it had a little extra joke quality to it. <laughs> because their humble little farmstead is nothing like. Um, but I have since learned, this is one of the, one of the things you, that happens with the internet. You find out stuff that, you know, you get con contacts from people. There's one in Ireland. There's one in Australia. There's one in South Carolina. There's one in Woodstock. I'll get these. Hi, Rokeby. I found you on the internet. We're Rokeby 2 Geo. We made it. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, that's why it's called Rokeby. In the earlier period, when Rowland and Rachel were the heads of household, it was called Locust Grove. And it was actually their son, Rowland Evans, later in the 19th century, who adopted. Yes. Yes, they're all over. Yeah. yeah, the black locusts. Now, there was a story in one of Dorothy Canfield Fisher's books about memories of Arlington, Vermont, where she, she's describing her great grandmother, who was a Holly, who I guess was pretty seriously. Crazy? Anti, yeah, no. <laughs> oh, anti slavery. An anti slavery mm -hmm. person. And, and, and Dorothy Canfield Fisher is making the point that even though she never met her great grandmother, she felt like she knew her. And one of uh -huh. the descriptions she makes is sitting as, if you can picture Arlington, there's St. James Church on, on Main Street, and across is the Canfield House. Right. But that was where Dorothy Canfield Fisher's great grandmother lived. And in her book, she describes um, when this Almira Holly Canfield heard that John Brown had been hung, she got up and, and made rang all the bell. The men, all the men in her family go over to that church and toll the bell all day long while she sat in the front parlor and read 
you know, the dire predictions from the Old Testament, you know, the, the oh, prophecies. Oh, wow. And, you know, and, and so I'm figuring there must have been an anti-slavery yeah, no, there society were, in Arlington because that lady would have been the bell weather. Well, there were, there were anti-slavery societies, you know, not necessarily female ones, but right. all over Vermont. Yeah. I mean, Vermont was amazing. I mean, after, after the uh, Vermont, the state society was formed in 1834, I mean, it was snowballed. And the amazing thing to me is like Jamaica. Jamaica or Peachum. 200 members. Now can you imagine if Peachum had anything with 200 members today? I mean, that's a lot of people for a little teeny town. And it just, it kind of went like a comet. These organizations spread all around the state. Not all around the state. There were some places like Burlington wasn't well, really... Tell them about John Henry Hopkins if they don't know. Well, and, and well, but he was much later. Oh. And in southern Vermont, it was less. But um, it just this, you know, it was it, it, it just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And then after 1840, it just kind of that was the split in the national. That split had reverberated all throughout the state. The Vermont Anti-Slavery Society split um, in 1843. Um, see, every, 1843 is such a weird year. I don't I want to write a book about 1843. Um, their split did not come over the issue of women, female participation. Another big issue, there were various issues that were, that were contentious and grinding and oh, kind of put people apart in the anti-slavery movement. One was the role of the churches. Because these people were Christians, because they came to this out of deep Christian faith, and a belief that slavery was a sin, they thought their churches were going to hop too. Yeah. Join them. Speak out. Blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? They didn't. You know, nobody likes an agitator. I mean, it, it's an embarrassment. These people, oh, they're just, they're too radical. They're too crazy. They're going to tear the country apart. So the churches were a little more staid. The ministers tended to be more, you know, a little more decorous. And they were saying, come on, come on. So they were always picking at them and pestering them. And um, the president of the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society was actually a congregational minister, Harvey Levitt. He was the minister of the Congregational Church in Virgins. And in 1843, they nominated Rowland Thomas Robinson. And that was the limit for people, because he had spoken out so strongly against the churches, they couldn't tolerate him as the head of the organization. So there was, a, and that year, by then they had already, um, they had really been declining. They, they had pr a printed annual report every year, 1835, 36, 37, 38. The printed report had died down. A and then it gets very difficult to find out exactly what was happening because you have to go to the newspapers. Yeah. That's where you can find out. And this, this 1843 report I, I, got, I get from a newspaper. Um, it, it was a big fight. S people walked out hollering, you know, you sit down, know. shut up, you know, that kind of. Except you the two con I think it's why you have the two congregational churches in Burlington, because one wasn't anti-slavery enough. Um, I'm not sure in Burlington. Yeah, that's it, why there's a college church congregation. That's church. definitely true all over. The yeah. second one was often called the Free Church, uh -huh. um, or the Commander Church. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the churches split. There was a Baptist church in Brandon, Orson Murray, who I referred to before, was the minister. They excommunicated all the rest of the Baptist churches in the country oh. <laughs> for not being anti-slavery enough. So there were, you know, there was some a little kooky, uh, but very sincere, committed action. Um, and after 1843, it's really hard to find. I, you know, I've been working on this in bits and pieces. I haven't really. I always say we have in our collection at Roque be 100 PhD dissertations. I just, I haven't got anybody, well, I shouldn't say that. I have had a few, but. And how do the local historical, I mean, how, how, is there any coordination between local historical associations or societies in the, the state and? Um, well, the Vermont, the Vermont Historical Society takes that role. Um, there's something called the League of Vermont Historical Societies. And do you, are, who's, are this, this is the library, not the historical site. Sorry, oh, right, I'm usually speaking to a, a, I'm usually a speaking, right. Well, Pat, oh, Patty's actually gone now, but um, sh there's a person, a staff person at VHS who has that job, and she sends an, an electronic newsletter 
you could probably get on it. I got on it. I, I sent her an email, because I, I know her, and said, you know, it occurred to me that I've never really surveyed the historical societies. Is there some way, I didn't know she had. Did catalog your information? Um, mm, it depends a lot on the local group. But she, she can communicate with all of them via email. They send information to her. They send news of their programs. They send collections, projects, new acquisitions, whatever might interest. So, so I said, could you, could you do this for me? And she said, oh, I have a regular newsletter. I said, oh, put me on your list. So now I get it. But she sent this out. And I, as I said, I had three or four people contact me. Um, with, with, and the other thing is, uh, sometimes people are active in their historical society, but they, they have collections that are theirs, their own collections. And I found out about a few of those, too. I didn't come up with anything like this Norwich book. But I felt like it went out there, and I, you know, I can feel like I've done due diligence. It's amazing how people will come through if you just put it out there. So that's good. Um, but you know, every well, every town could try. I mean, you could just any town could start doing its own its own abolitionist history to find out were there people active, if there were, who were they, what did they do. Um, it's something to make sure that that Howard Coffin thing. Yes. Well, you know, you know, he's really Howard, to his great uh, credit, has a very expansive view. I mean, he's including us in in in, in that project, and um, I think, you know, something that was a contributing factor to the Civil War is something that he would well, one of the he would be interested about in. First meeting of people interested in studying where, who, and what sites and people were involved. Um, thought, well, is there anybody that has the time or the excitement to go through the earliest papers? Yes. See if yes. there are any Essex references yes. to any organization, Ladies' Aid Society? I mean, there, you, you probably had a paper here. This was a reasonable... Yeah, it's like the Burlington Clipper. Well, do you, didn't Essex have any... Yeah, it, not no, really Okay. But I will look. I yeah, you, you, you never know. Yeah. You just got to wonder what's sitting in some people's attic. No. Well, the Burlington yeah. Clipper, I think, was what covered Burlington. Well, there were many. There were many. Burlington had a whole raft of papers. I mean, it would have had a, a pro-slavery paper, an anti-slavery paper, an anti-Masonic paper, a Republican paper, a Congregational paper, a Baptist paper. I mean, there were a lot of papers, and they very much tended to have a point of view. You're welcome. Yeah, does anyone else have so a question? A vast audience, but more people well, see it. Yeah. 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 Yes, so good. Now, is this letters? from the Underground Railroad available for purchase by public libraries? In yes, it's five dollars. Oh. This is our rack card. This is our this is a calendar of our events for this summer. Um, it's not gonna it's not printed yet. This is just a photocopy something so I could bring it. One thing I will mention is to, uh, next week, Wednesday, we have the, a talk by Kevin Gracknino of the oh. Historic Society. Oh, what's he talking about? Consuelo in Northrop Bailey oh. mm. and the Pathfinder. And then we have a display of her Realia in her shingle from when she was a lawyer in the glass case. Wow. From UVM Special Collections Department. Oh, cool. A young man, Travis Puller, who's a library school student and a graduate, you know, he's uh, got a graduate degree in classics from UVM, is, we, we pushed him to a library school and he's, he's <laughs> doing her work, you know, doing, studying her papers. And then the, the week after that, we have a, a discussion on a holy war in the world, in world history, a lecture by Emeritus Professor of Medieval History uh, from UVM, Alfred Andreas. So huh. quite a few history things, but these two are for women's history and con connected up with Consuelo. Well, if anybody finds out anything about well, female anti-slavery activity, you know who to send it to. You might as well mm -hmm. say, your, say your phone number real clearly for the camera. So 877 eight, seven, <laughs> eight, seven, seven, But Jane knows she's not here, so thank Rokeby you. Rokeby at Comcast.net, that's uh -huh. easier. Right, these days.